and welcome to our second webinar that you can get the most out of your patch series as part of the 2020 Sustainable Garden Awards. Before I begin, I would like to start with an acknowledgement of our traditional owners of the land in which we're presenting on today, the Ghana people, and I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today we'll be hearing from Melissa Bradley from Water Sensitive Urban Design and we'll learn about a range of practical solutions for your garden and your property. Questions can be asked uh, through the live chat function on YouTube. Uh, we will monitor these questions that you pose and uh, put them to Melissa and she will either answer them throughout the presentation or at an appropriate time. So I am going to hand over to Melissa now to present. Hello everyone. Um, so Welcome to Water Sensor Urban Design in Your Garden. We will be going through a series of topics that um, Naomi has canvassed with you uh, to um, introduce you to some of these concepts. So the, what we'll be covering today is water sensitive urban design principles just in general, just so you can see what's driving this. Um, a bit of um, urbanisation and how it changes the catchment hydrology because those principles will guide um, all of the other um, me methods of water sensitive urban design that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, so I'm going to cover off rainwater harvesting and reuse so that you can get the maximum value out of your rainwater tank. And we'll do a little bit on grey water as an alternative water source. Um, and then we're going to look outside your home. We're going to look at um, permeable and porous pavings, uh, infiltration systems to get help get um, the water to passively um, irrigate your gardens. Um, vegetated swales and buffer strips are sort of another variation of the theme to get water back into the environment. And a little bit on um, rain gardens and their plant species selection. And if we've got a bit of time, we might have a look at some case studies of what um, others have done in and around their homes. So um, that's a bit of an overview for you. So hopping straight into the principles of water sensitive urban design, uh, one thing that's really fundamental to this is um, the idea that we want to reintegrate water back into the urban landscape to get balance back into the urban water cycle, but also to create microclimate as our cities um, heat, heat up due to the, all the hard paved surfaces and, and materials. And this is another way to get some cooling. Uh, it's also um, another principle is to reuse water at its source, so where it falls. Um, or where it's generated, or as close as possible as you can to that source. Um, another principle that's going to drive what we're looking at is um, protecting receiving water quality. So that's your, your streams, your urban streams, and then ultimately the marine environment. So, you know, um, intercepting stormwater and using it or treating it um, is going to uh, protect those downstream um, in, uh, water, water resources. And then the other idea is that we're going to use water that's fit for purpose. So fit for purpose water use is only using a water of a certain quality um, that's needed for that use. So the idea of why would we use drinking water to flush a toilet if rainwater um, that's had only like primary treatment of getting out leaves and, and a few sediments will do the trick. So it is trying to match the demand with the water quality that you need. So those principles are going to drive what we talk about today. So first of all, this is your the, the most technical part of the talk, and this is a bit of an introduction to how um, the, the changes that we're making to the urban environment are affecting hydrology and then how that's going to influence the sort of solutions that we choose in our households and in our gardens. So if you could imagine you have a hectare of forest and, a, and 10 million litres of rain fall on that forest. 85% of that rainfall would be lost to the air by transpiration or evapotranspiration and all the cooling effects that that brings. And only 15% of that water would um, make it into the soils and probably only you know, 5 to 7% would ever make it through to the stream. If we pave that um, area or we build over it, uh, what will happen is we'll virtually flip that that balance on its head. Probably about 
15% of the water that's sort of lying in gutters or lying around on um, hard paved surfaces will evaporate. And then probably about 85% of it will um, go be discharged to the stormwater system and then ultimately to um, a creek and then the marine environment. And when we get that extra stormwater running off into the creek, it takes with it any pollutants that are on the hard paved surfaces. But it's also the, the volume and the rate that it's coming off is eroding our urban streams. Um, and when they when they erode, they, they take more sediments with it, and then those sediments end up in the Gulf and they damage the sea grasses. So we've got um, this change in the cycle that we've um, affected as humans without with how we build. Um, and then, but there is there are ways to reverse that, and and that can be done um, at all scales. So um, just to this is like the little technical graph, but I hope it'll help you understand. So in a natural system, you imagine the water, it'll rain, and this is sort of water flow rate over time, uh, flow rate in the um, the y-axis and then the x-axis, you've got time. If you imagine this red line's a natural system, it'll rain, it'll rain, nothing will run off because it's soaking into the ground. Once the ground's wet, it'll slowly um, start to run off. You hit a bit of a peak, a small peak, and then it will, the storm's over and it will dissipate. Once we pave a system um, and make it hard paved surfaces, of course, th there won't be as much soaking into the ground, so the water will run off quicker. Um, not only will it run off quicker, but more water will run off because none of it's lost to the ground for the soaking soaking um, into the ground with infiltration. So we'll get a much higher uh, flow rate, so the rate that it comes off. And then we'll also get a much larger volume, so the area under the graph is the total volume that runs off. So basically we just sort of um, um, exaggerate everything. Um, so we've got it how what, and how what we need to do is deal with that extra runoff and that extra volume. That's the bit that we have to get out of the system because in the natural system that was never there. That that was the part that evapor transpired or transpired from the from the forested system or the grass system. So this is the bit that we're trying to manage um, and keep out of the stormwater network. So in Utopia, if we if if we had the perfect lot scale solution, um, you would have your rain falling on your roof. We'd harvest it in rainwater tanks and reuse it back into the house. If we didn't have room um, for a above ground tank, we could um, build one underground. You can see here on the left, um, and then any. Uh, overflow from those tanks would be directed to a, a rain garden or a swale that would slowly infiltrate into the garden. Um, all of our hard paved surfaces would be re redirecting our paths, would be redirected to gardens to help that water soak in. And if there were, after all of that, if there was any excess, it would go into some sort of rain garden into the, um, the nature strip. And if there was a um, an alternative water scheme from council that might, like a treated stormwater or recycled wastewater, that would come back into the house as an alternative water source via a purple pipe system. So that's Utopia. Um, we can't expect everyone to do that on their lot, but that's that sort of, today we're gonna to go through elements of that and break that down to look at which parts of that might be suitable for your, um, for your property where you live now or where you might be planning to live in the future. So um, we're going to look at this sort of multiple criteria. We're trying to manage volume, we're trying to manage flow management, improve water quality, and water efficiency means replacing an alternative, replacing potable water like your mains water with an alternative water source. So that's what we're going to be covering tonight. Um, and if you have a think about um, all the different elements that we I spoke about in the introduction that we're going to cover, um, and and what which of these um, targets around volume management, peak flow management, stormwater quality, runoff quality management, and water efficiency. Um, there are a range of all of these um, solutions that I spoke about at the start that contribute to meeting these targets. And what you, what's important to know is that um, rainwater tanks, permeable paving, and infiltration systems actually tick the most boxes, so they contribute to the majority of these outcomes. So if we if we were trying to um, you know, introduce a, um, some sort of solution that met multiple criteria and added you know multiple benefits, 
um, those three would be the um, the key go to. But for um, other reasons, we might choose to do um, biofilters because we've got a real water quality issue. Um, that's what you, you might see um, councils doing. Um, and we might also look at swales and, and on site detention, which I'll talk a bit more about when we get to the rainwater tanks. So, yeah, so that's just a bit of a look up table to help you guide where you might want to um, spend your energy if you're trying to be holistic about the solutions that you're looking at for your home. So I've, um, I'm going to pause regularly um, and just see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, I haven't seen any come through as yet, but keep them coming to uh, know if you don't understand anything, um, she's going to send them through. Um, so um, just raise them via the comment section and I can address them as we go or when I pause at the end of each section. So since we don't have any at the moment, I'm just going to continue on. Um, and then we'll look at water sensitive urban design inside the home. So um, rainwater and harvesting and reuse is a, a key opportunity for us to um, better use water and to also um, add value to your home or your outdoors with um, an alternative water source that you harvest from your own um, scheme um, from your roof um, of your house or your shed or the like. There are a few things that just you need to um, probably keep in mind if you're looking to set up a rainwater harvesting scheme. If you are going to plummet back into your house, um, the, what, what we recommend is that you um, provide a, like a treatment train, um, which means you treat the water um, at multiple points along the way before it hits your tank so that you can have a suitable um, water quality. Even if you're trying to flush a toilet, I hear people say, oh, the water's brown and that's from the um, gum leaves that make it from the gutter then into the tank. So what we want to do is, you know, how can we take out some of those impurities so the water quality in our tank is um, suitable to flush through our toilets or if you're looking to connect it to your laundry cold tap or your hot water surface, it's actually of a quality that's suitable for that. So they're probably the one of the obvious ones is gutter guards to keep um, leaves out of your gutter. Um, also, rain heads on where your um, your gutters discharge to your downpipe. They also deflect leaves. But probably the most important one is called a first flush diverter. And I'm, I'll, I've got a picture of one which I'll show you in a minute and I'll explain how they work. Um, and then you can also um, put in uh, a filter. Um, prior to the water going into your tank as well. So, um, and if you did all of those things, you would have um, a very, very high quality of water going into your system and you wouldn't experience any of those um, issues that I spoke about, about discoloration of your, of your um, water supply. When you're selecting the, rain, the, the size of your rainwater tank, there are a few things that will um, determine what what, what your yield is. So that the yield is kind of how much over a year you will be able to harvest and reduce from your tank. So we need to consider issues of um, the supply of your system, so how much you can harvest, and then also the demand that you draw down on your system. So yield will, your yield will depend on um, your annual rainfall, and you can't do anything about that. So that's a bit of a, um, you know, depending where you live, um, that's just uh, something we can't affect. But the things in red are all things that you can affect. So your roof area connected to your tank. Um, we recommend that at least 80% of your roof is connected to get um, a, you know, a reasonable quantity of, quantity of water to your tank. Um, ideally, you could, if you're killed, you could collect 100% um, of your roof area. But that will be determined by um, you know, where your downpipes are located and then where your um, rainwater tank is located. So um, it might be that, um, well, I'll come back to that issue in a minute. And then another issue is the amount and frequency of rainwater use. So if you can imagine um, every time you turn on a tap and flush, flush with your rainwater, you draw down on the tank. So the more you draw, the more you use the water, the more you draw down, the next storm event, when the next storm event comes, the more space in your tank there is to store water. If, uh, for instance, you you only use the um, rainwater for one toilet and flush with that, it actually wouldn't draw down a lot on your tank. And so 
really you're just you're basically just going to draw down a little bit it'll top up for the next rain and draw down a little bit so you're really only getting that sort of additional storage out of that part but if you connect to lots of uses you'll draw down next storm event it'll fill more and you're going to get better value out of your tank um, the other issue that's going to affect your yield is the size of your tank so you can imagine if i have a 3000 litre tank um, it will spill um, occasionally but if i had a 5000 litre tank it's going to um, spill less frequently, um, fill and spill. So it's, it is, but there's a sweet point, and sometimes bigger isn't always better, and I'll explain that in a minute. So, um, but we want to connect as many down point, uh, down pipes as we can, but but also finding that sweet spot um, is is going to be the challenge. And I'll take you through a graph that we've um, developed or a um, table that was we've developed to help you find that sweet spot. So, for instance, if you lived in Adelaide and we use Kent Town's um, rainfall data, and you wanted to connect just to your dual flush toilet and 100% of your laundry with your front load washing machine, and you connected uh, 100 square metres of your roof to a 2,000 litre tank, that combination would meet the demand of your toilet flushing and your laundry 77% of the time. And you might be happy and you might go 77% of the time, yeah, that's not bad, I'll stick with that. Or you might think, actually, I'd like it to be a bit more reliable than that. You've got an option, you could upsize your rainwater tank to a 5,000 litre tank if you have room, um, and that will meet the demand of the dual flush toilet and the 100% front load laundry, and this is for a three person household, by the way, 87% of the time. However, you could get the same performance by just keeping the 2,000 litre tank and connecting it to 200 square metres of roof. So basically increasing your catchment because um, it will harvest more each time it rains. But of course, um, it, and it, so it's just this balance. But it might be, upsizing your rainwater tank is actually quite cheap. Um, it's actually a lot of the fittings um, and the rest of the system that um, adds to the cost. So it might be cheaper to keep your um, 100 square metres connected and upsize your tank if you have room than provide all of the additional pipe network to connect up more um, down pipes, if you're doing a, particularly if you're doing a retrofit. Um, if you're doing a new build, it, it might be more cost effective. So I just the take home message really is, bigger isn't always better. It's the combination of the rainwater roof harvesting with the demand, with the size of your tank, that um, you know, getting that all in balance for your need um, is is all um, part of the picture. If you want to irrigate as well, being mindful that a lot of the rainfall comes in winter, we do get those summer storms, um, so you're often going to the demand for your for your water over the summer period is not necessarily when the rain is falling, so you might want to go quite a bit larger to have more be able to store more of that winter rain. We do have a tool called the Insight Water Tool, which is um, optimises your rainwater tank for all of those categories that I spoke about, volume management and flow management, et cetera. More for, it's more designed for a new build, but um, if you're a bit you're, you know, savvy on using, um, I suppose, technical tools on the um, internet, you might be able, you could put in, um, the, uh, use that tool to have a look at your um, rain guard, your rain irrigation system, and your um, your harvesting system, and you could actually look at what's a good size for you for your um, garden if you want to use your rainwater for your garden. So if anyone gets stuck on that at the end of the presentation, you'll see my phone number and my email address. Um, you're more than welcome to contact me, and I can help help take you through how to use that tool to optimize your rainwater tank. For your garden area. Okay, so what I'm showing you here, this is the setup under my back deck. So um, uh, I'm just going to show you what a first flush device looks like. So um, we've got the downpipe um, coming down here um, from my roof, uh, and what happens is the water it actually goes to ground level and comes back up, but because um, there's it's, the pipes are always full 
to the level of the water in the tank. So if my tank was full, the down pipes would be full to that same height. And what happens is with the first flush diverter, the water comes in off the reef, the first sort of 20 to 30 litres is diverted through this um, little storage and slowly trickles out. There's actually a really tiny hose um, diameter pipe at the bottom. So the first lot of water that comes through that has all the debris and the silt and some leaves in it sometimes, uh, if they're not picked up with the um, gutter guards, etc., will flush through that system and that'll take a lot of the impurities out. And then uh, once that first flush goes through, the remainder of the water continues on into um, the rainwater tank. And so, um, and then this part will just slowly drip away into the garden, that first flush. And once it's full, it just gets bypassed. So, um, the, and that's probably one of the most effective ways to keep your rainwater tank clean. Um, and I would recommend any system that you're considering would have a first, first flush device. They range in price from about $70 to about $150. So um, really, relatively inexpensive to give you a much higher quality of water for your system. Um, so really with your maintenance of your rainwater tanks, just remember, um, I won't go through all of these because we don't have time, but you'll get a copy of this afterwards via Naomi. But just remember, um, you know, keeping that treatment train clean and just um, regularly maintaining your system if you're going to use um, rainwater um, for a, particularly inside the home, um, it's most critical. Um, if you're just going to use it on your garden, you know, the, the necessity for that is much, much less. So, but this is really, you know, keep that quality up for your indoor use. If you want to know more about that, you can go to the Water Sensitive SA website, um, hit on the community tab at the top, and then you'll see um, these uh, four options and then click on um, rainwater tanks for your home and backyard, maximising the value of your rainwater tank, and that'll take you through to the resources that I mentioned in the talk then. So just seeing the chat, um, seems like we're all good for any questions now. Um, haven't seen anything come through yet from Naomi. So um, I'll just take a bit of a quick second break and then I will continue on. Okay. So um, some of you asked your interest in grey water as a potential um, resource for your garden. So there's just a few things to, um, well, first I'll def define what grey water is. Um, it's wastewater that's generated from your shower, your bath, your hand basin, um, your laundry water, um, your kitchen sinks and your dishwashers. Um, however, it's not really recommended that you use your kitchen water because often they're full of uh, greases, oils and fats. Um, so unless you're going through a um, large scale system, um, not recommended that you connect up the kitchen. Um, however, um, and so what I'm going to show you is some sort of more um, temporary, um, cheaper option systems that are, are more of a retrofit um, that doesn't require a, a, like a major, um, a major system. Um, but it, um, in the installation of a permanent grey water system does actually require approval from council. So if you do want to go, um, if you have a big garden and you think, yeah, I need grey water to keep my garden alive, um, certainly have it start having a chat to council about what their systems are. But I'm going to show you through um, a few, um, you know, systems that are quite cost effective if you want to just use them um, and, and you can use them, you don't, obviously if you're not a homeowner um, but you, you're you renting, these are things that you could do as a renter as well and some of them. So um, just be mindful that grey water should only be used for subsurface irrigation. It shouldn't be sprayed onto any plants. And that's just to make sure if there's any um, nasty bacteria in it, um, it that, that you don't contaminate it um, and it doesn't hit people or animals. Um, so that's really critical. But um, probably the um, most important thing is that if you have a, a contemporary um, grey water system where you're just using um, a simplified system, which I'll go through in a minute, um, they can, you can only store for up to 24 hours from the discharge. So let's say you used your laundry grey water um, and, and you wanted to irrigate um, so your lawn with it or you wanted to irrigate um, under a fruit tree, um, that, that system you would only be able to um, store for 
up to 24 hours before you had to use it. Any longer than that, the bacteria starts to grow and it's not recommended, it's not, it's not safe for use. Um, also make sure that you just don't use it near your close to your buildings and um, property boundaries so you don't get overspray uh, to your neighbours or you know, overflow to your neighbours. Um, if you're in the area where there's wells or bores, um, you generally can't use wastewater anywhere within 50 metres of a bore. So on any normal house lot, that would preclude it um, unless you're on quite um, a large lot. Um, and it's not recommended that you irrigate your fruits, vegetables um, with the water um, just because it may have contaminants in it. Um, if you're going to use grain water, make sure you switch to, if you don't already, you switch to environmentally French friendly shampoos and detergents. Um, and you really want um, products that have low levels of boron, phosphorus and salt so that you're not building those, um, having those built up, those salts building up in your soils and then damaging your garden. Um, and if you do, um, if you do use one of these sort of mobile units that you can, um, they've got their own little pump and you can wheel them around, um, really good to just move it around your property um, in various locations. Don't just keep um, irrigating the same spot with them, otherwise you will get um, those salts building up. Um, also good to um, occasionally, you know, you know, obviously irrigate with um, other, other, you know, your, your potable water from time to time. Um, obviously, like, don't use bleach as hair dyes or paint products um, in anywhere near one of these systems. Um, so if you wanted to um, use it, just to um, prevent pooling and runoff of your grey water into other properties is another um, important thing because that pooled water can go septic, so you want to make sure it's infiltrating straight into the ground. It can be slightly alkaline, so some plants might not like it. So if you're an avid gardener and you know plants, um, you know, like a more neutral or acidic kind of um, water supply, just be very careful because it, it will be alkaline, generally speaking. Um, and then obviously keep an eye on areas that you do irrigate with it and if it's, um, you know, you're seeing evidence of any damage, you need to stop or um, move it to another area or dilute it a bit because um, yeah, just, to, just to make sure that it's not causing any damage to your plants or your soils. Um, so that's it for grey water. Um, and that, like I said, I'll just go back actually. Some of those systems, um, it's actually not hidden, it's hidden very well. This one here costs about $600. Um, they can, some of those more portable ones can be up to about $1,500. So uh, again, um, if you're trying to drought proof your property, um, it's not a bad um, solution to try and actually find an alternative water supply if there's um, water restrictions in the future. All righty. Um, continuing on with the outside the home, I'm just going to talk through um, permeable paving and porous paving. Um, what you, if you think back to that start of the talk where I said, you know, if we make our urban area more impervious, we will, um, you know, add to the stormwater runoff, but we're also adding to the heat of our um, gardens um, and around our homes. But if we can choose a porous or permeable product, um, it, it will add to the infiltration and um, help with the urban cooling. So we've got a few tips about um, how you could approach paving around your home. Um, and I suppose the first question is um, just check, do you need to pave at all? Like and I can, if, if you need um, good uh, access for, um, you know, wheelchair access um, or um, elderly, for sure, you might not want to have a slightly rough surface. But um, the question is, if you don't need to pave, um, you know, why pave at all? Um, around In Adelaide, often there'll be a um, concrete path around the perimeter of the house to protect the footings from um, changes in moisture due to the clay, reactive clay soils. But beyond that, um, there's there's no real reason why we would want to pave our area. Um, you know, there's, there's no, no um, sorry, engineering reason to do it. There might be other reasons to do it. So one of them is don't pave at all. The other is to use um, a pervious product. Now, there are so many of them out there, and I've just picked a snapshot of them. Um, so this one on the top left, that is called um, Geotech Substrate Stabiliser. That's the product, but there's many, many you can get. It's, it's like a honeycomb, and it's a, um, like a stabiliser. So um, gravel driveways are one way to choose a driveway product, a driveway that is um, pervious, so water can infiltrate through the gravel and go through the ground. 
but some people don't like the heave that your wheels of your um, tyres of your car create over time. But if you um, prepare your base of your driveway as you would as if you were concreting, just a, a nice firm sub-base, put these um, substrate stabilisers in, these sort of plastic honeycombs, and then put the gravel over the top, they give that extra strength um, so that you can put heavier vehicles on it, but also to stop that heave. Another product is um, several products are permeable pavers, and what they really are, most of these products are the actual paver itself isn't necessarily permeable. It's the space between the pavers that is permeable. Um, and these three products here are all made in South Australia. This um, Adbury Masonry Trihex, uh, the best bricks pavers have got little notches out of the corners of the bricks. Uh, same with this Little Hampton Smart Pave. So um, they have varying degrees of performance in terms of how much water is infiltrated. And then you backfill between those um, in the gaps with um, sort of like a, a small aggregate, like a, you know, a sort of a two to seven mil aggregate, like small aggregate um, of uh, consistent size. You don't want to get um, stones that are variable sizes because the um, stones will, the small stones will fall in the voids between the bigger stones, and that's not what you want. You want as much water to go through as possible, so they should all be the same size. Um, I'm going to stop um, sharing for a minute my screen so that you can see me a bit clearer. So there's a few products out there that um, can help you that are porous products. And you might have noticed exposed aggregates are pretty common driveway material at the moment. It looks really lovely, but highly impervious. There's a few products out there, and I'll go back to in a minute, Stone Set. It's a, it looks a lot like an aggregate. I'll stop moving there. It comes in a range of different colours and textures and sizes of stones. That's actually porous. And um, when it rains, water actually, there are actually voids in between those stones and the water will infiltrate those stones um, and then go through to the subsurface and um, you know, go to your, you know, the ground and help your trees. There's another one which um, is uh, the mod, uh, the, the Modi system, and this is, it looks a bit like a cake tin upside down, but what happens is, this is for your concrete driveway, you would put the reinforcing bars in your concrete slab um, around these, um, uh, these, raised profiles and then you pour the concrete in once the concrete sets you punch out these um, covers and then this leaves a void that you can grow uh, mondo grass uh, regular grass whatever you like in it and I'll, I'll go back to my presentation Oops, I got the noise there. just share again for you Okay, so back to the presentation. So, um, just, sorry, I'm just connecting in my screens here. Um, so that one, that Modi one is the one I just showed you. You can see that the Mondo grass is growing in the voids. So that's turned what would have otherwise been a, um, you know, 100% impervious um, driveway into something that might be more like, you know, 60% impervious and you've got 40% of it is now growing grass. And then that grass can um, help cool down and soften soften the look and the um, heat off of that. And so, and the stone set product, the one that I showed you before with the aggregate is um, this one here on the bottom right. Um, permeable pavers, um, what they look like underneath is they've just got um, sort of a, a sort of a stony, uh, just prepare your subgrade, then you've got some gravel on top um, with a little bit of sand. And then what happens is the water, as I described before, the water comes in into the voids between the pavers and comes down and infiltrates into either the ground if it's unlined system, if you're away from buildings, or you can actually line the system and it can kind of form a bit of a storage and then discharge to council's uh, drainage network. So that's what they look like in cross section. Um, I'm just going to show you a short video, see how we go with this. And this is um, just in the background here, this is a car park in the city of Mitchell and um, St Mary's. Um, you've got the permeable paver, the Adbury one um, in the um, background there, and then this um, in the foreground is a porous ash felt, which is very similar to this looking to the stone set product, but it's made from 50% recycled rubber in this case. Um, I'll just let you see how it performs. Let's see how we go. Mm. 
not working. All right, I'm just going to stop sharing and I'll, I'll open it up separately. Okay, I'm going to start. I'll share a different screen for you. And if you have a look at this. Okay, I'm just going to pop it on now. I can watch it in action. As you can see here, so this is a water truck delivering um, water at a rate that you could really expect from a, you know, a relatively intense storm. Um, the water flows in um, the general um, grade of that car park is from the left to right, um, and there's a gutter to the right of the screen. But as you can see, the water doesn't even flow more than about a metre, and it, then it already infiltrates into um, through the um, porous asphalt and through the pinwheel paver into the subgrade. And there's actually a um, ag, ag pipe underneath that was actually called a mega flow system, which is like a, a ag pipe covered in geotextile. And then that takes any water that infiltrates into um, the me a median strip between um, the rows of car parking where there's garden bed and it irrigates the garden bed. So um, it's a really effective way to harness the, the stormwater that hits a car park that would otherwise end up in the um, in the stormwater system, um, and you could do that um, very easily in your own um, home. Either of those products would work really well in a um, in a you know um, home situation, not just a public um, realm situation. So I'll go back to my presentation. Um, okay. Okay. Hopefully you're seeing the screen too. Okay, so that's um, the main things. There was just one more slide I wanted to show you. So that's porous or permeable solutions, and anything you can do to get water back into the environment, um, and that you know, using reducing your hard paved surfaces will ensure that your gardens around the area receives far more water than it otherwise would to help sustain it during the drier period. Um, and then the other thing is um, to think about is only pave where absolutely necessary. So um, particularly in a modern um, driveway, we've got a lot shorter distance between the, um, the property boundary and the house where you wouldn't actually be doing much turning of your wheels. You'd be just driving straight into your garage. So really, um, this one down the bottom left, why would we pave um, an area where our, wheel, where our wheels will never go? So here's an opportunity to sort of put um, some sort of um, vegetation in the central part or to the side, a mondo grass, something similar. Um, so, yeah, and this is, a, you know, back in, you know, the 80s, we often um, we saw a lot of these sort of driveways, but we just don't see them um, much anymore. But really, um, probably had it right back 20 30 years ago. So having a bit of think about where do you actually need to pave before you do your paving. Um, one of the things just to think about, about permeable paving, is it worth doing? Well, this little graph here, um, this is um, just shows you what um, uh, the intensity of rainfall events in Adelaide. So we get a lot of our rainfall events are really quite small, like one millimetre an hour, up to two, three, four millimetres an hour. So most rainfall events are more are, are no more than four millimetres an hour, those permeable paving systems can take, some of them can take up to 10 millimetres um, to infiltrate before they shed off any rainwater. So what that means is most of those small little events could be absorbed in your um, permeable paving or your porous paving systems and then make their way back into the subsurface soil to add, value, add, add water to your garden and they need not ever um, reach the stormwater system. And, and you're getting the benefit. So it's something to think about moving forward. Um, if you want to find out a bit more about permeable paving and, and link through to some of those um, different products, particularly the South Australian ones, um, you can find that, again, go to our community page and then go to Reducing Hard Surfaces Outside Your Home and you can download some of that information and click through to additional information. So um, now's a good time. I'm about to change topics again. So if anyone does have any questions, um, I've got a bit of a natural pause if you have any. No? Okay. 
Um, the other thing that you indicated you were interested in in the um, feedback back to Naomi was, um, okay, so oh, here Naomi said she's linking through the website, that's great, um, is on-site retention of stormwater via infiltration. So if you are an avid gardener, um, the, the, if, and if you've got room in your yard, the best thing that you can do with your stormwater, and if you've got the right soils, a few uh, disclaims there, is to um, take your roof water and infiltrate it into the soils um, and um, just to get keep water up to your, um, you know, particularly for your trees. It, 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 it's not so great for lawns. It won't keep your lawn green, but it will, unless you've got a line system, um, but it will um, keep your trees alive in over drought position um, time. So infiltration systems, there's a, there's a minister specification, um, um, 78 AA for on-site retention of stormwater, and it, it helps you size an infiltration system suitable to your catchment, so your roof, um, but it also in terms of its uh, the um, yeah, so the size, depth, etc. But it also explains where you can and cannot put infiltration systems. So basically, they only recommend the, the, the guideline only covers um, uh, sandy soils and moderately reactive clay soils. Soil. So if you've got a highly reactive clay or a moderately reactive clay, you'd have to get some engineering advice. Uh, but depending on the size of your lot. It's not impossible, it's just that um, you need to go to export. That's outside the range of this guideline. But really, take home messages if you've got the right soils is you need to keep three metres off the boundary just in case someone's got another structure right up against the boundary and the infiltration system could affect their footings. And you want to keep three metres away from your own dwelling. Again, if you've got uh, sort of more reactive clay soils, you'd be having to put that offset to be greater and greater. Um, depending on your soils. So that's just something to think about. Um, what, it, what they kind of look like is this sort of get a downpipe coming down from your roof. Um, it might go via a little, um, just a little inspection pit so you can take out any um, silt or dirt and then it would discharge into a, a underground trench and I'll show you what they look like in a minute. Um, any excess from your infiltration system would have to be returned back to council's drainage system. So there would be like a another pit and an overflow pipe out to the verge um, or to the curb and gutter. Um, so um, that's sort of like what they look like in cross section. What what they might look like in reality, this is actually one from the city of Mitcham that's in the streetscape, but really they're quite a simple design. Um, you dig out your trench, if it's a trench style, um, line it with a geotech fabric, um, you might put a um, subsurface drain in there um, if you're connecting back to council's um, drainage system, if you're on a small lot and that's a critical um, factor. And then backfill it with um, um, aggregate or stone. Again, you want stone that's of a uniform size, like probably like, you know, a 20 mil aggregate or stone. Uh, we don't want that variable particles because, again, the small particles will fill the voids. And if they fill the voids, that's less storage space for you for water to store in. So again, you want the, the um, uniform size stones. Um, with, in terms of um, sizing your infiltration system, um, there's a lookup table in that um, minister specification that I mentioned. Um, so for instance, again, you've got a 100 square metre roof and then you've got um, a sort of a sandy soil. Um, you'd have to have, um, and you had a 0.9 metre wide trench um, and a 0.5 metre deep trench, then you'd need to have an 8.6 metre long trench to um, manage the roof runoff from that um, from that area. And it, it, and it treats, for anyone who's an engineer out there who's listening, um, it treat, that's, that'll deal with the design storm of a one in five year, one hour storm. So um, that's quite large. So sometimes you think, well, maybe a Maybe that won't be suitable because I can't get an eight, eight metre trench in my backyard, but it could still be two four metre long trenches as long as you can get the offsets from the boundaries and the building. Um, but you might also want to con consider um, a, a vertical pit because you can. it's easier, obviously a pit going, putting your storage down instead of horizontally makes it a lot easier to get, um, you don't have those offset issues because it's actually quite uh, a localised um, storage. 
So that's just one thing to remember. Again, what it looks like, similar design comes down off the roof, um, you discharge to the pit, um, and usually they'd be, well, they would be bottomless, so it infiltrates to the local soil environment. Um, depending on the style of it, that would not normally be a product you can buy off the shelf, so it would be completely hollow. So again, you can actually get a lot more storage in that space because it's not backfilled with stones, um, but you do have to have like um, good safety um, covers on the pits, etc. And then the overflow would go back to the curb and gutter or any un underground pipe and council stormwater network. Um, there are um, is a bit of a cross section detail for anyone who's really quite interested in that. Um, and I'll leave that to you to have a look at at your leisure if this is something that you're um, thinking about doing. And like I said, I'll, you'll get the um, presentation made by, uh, available by Naomi so that you can have a bit more detailed look at it. Um, and again, there's sizing charts um, for the pit style as well. So if you can, if you don't hit um, bedrock, because there's, you know, there's some situations that you can't use it if you've got really hot, uh, shallow bedrock or if you're on a steep slope and um, I had a, there's a slide in there that describes sort of some of the situations you can't do it in and it's also in the guideline but certainly um, a vertical pits are, are possibly the way to go if you have got the right um, situation you don't have high ground water where you live as well. Um, really good way to get water into the soils particularly if you've got big trees around they'll just soak it right up and love it. Um, so here's a few of the, um, just a bit of detail on where it is suitable and where it's not recommended. Um, so again, slopey ground, have to be careful, um, but I'll let, again, have, let you have a look at that at your leisure. So, um, all right. Okay, I've got a question here, so I'll just come back to that. Let's have a look. So I'm pausing. Uh, uh, okay, so I think the question's about permeable paving. Okay, yeah. So great concepts for the home. How about larger scale like footpaths and roads? Um, yep, there is. Um, a lot of councils are actually using permeable paving in situations where you can't, um, they can't get water away from a low point and there's no underground drainage system, um, particularly laneways um, in sort of older suburbs. Um, um, I will, what I'll do at the end of the um, talk, I'll send through to Naomi a few examples. Um, there's Kegworth Road in um, Mid City of Mitcham area and Duncan Lane in the city of West Torrance. No, Duncan, yeah, Duncan Lane in the city of West Torrance. Um, there are some really good examples, and we've got cross sections. And um, in the city of Mitcham case, they've harvested the stormwater from a street that used to flood. Uh, very like three or four times a year and now they collect it in a permeable paved um, roadway and it's only permeable paved in the intersections that you don't even have to do the whole road just in a few low points and then they uh, divert the water into their adjacent local park to water their gum tree so oh um, there's a case study of that on our website so we'll um, send you all the links to that and you can have a look at how it's done at a larger scale um, and certainly, um, if you'd like going to Adelaide Oval, go to Fig Plaza at the back of Adelaide Oval or to the north of Adelaide Oval, uh, and they've got lots of permeable paving around there, and they've directed um, water to um, rain gardens in the car park there, and they're thriving. They're absolutely thriving. Um, so how are we going for time? Okay, we've got 10 minutes left. Um, so I've got... Um, I'm going to quickly do vegetated swales um, and rain gardens. Um, just to these are ways to get again keep water in the environment in your backyard. So a vegetated swale is really um, it's effective at removing sediment. It promotes infiltration and it sort of delays those peak flows. Um, this little one in the picture you can see this downpipe from the front yard. The water flows across their front lawn into this swale in the front yard. Um, so quite simple. The, the thing to know, though, is often in a smaller urban environment, you will need to have subsurface uh, um, uh, drainage pipe so that your any excess can be water can be returned to council's drainage network, and you don't create a nuisance problem um, of water flowing over into your neighbour's property. So just something to keep in mind. Here's a few more examples of how others have done some swales. Just adjacent to a path, the water will flow 
um, the path will be on a slight angle so that the water from the path flows to um, the garden bed. And so then really you're making the most of that water and it's um, being collected in that little swale. Um, obviously this one here on the bottom right is more of a um, you know, public realm in a median strip. But um, they can be done at all scales, um, but certainly suitable for a backyard if you've got space. Um, really just some, some things to remember about it. You, you don't want a slope of more than 5 to 20 percent. Um, and really you don't need much of the um, excavation. So um, all up um, the depth of it would be about 150 mil um, and then you probably have another 150 mil of topsoil once you've ex excavated and shaped the um, swale, but you want to have a minimum width of about 100 square metres. You can plant, plant various plants in there, um, you know, dry, dry, drought tolerant species, because it's not going to get a lot of water if it's coming from your downpipe, particularly if it's an overflow from a rainwater tank, because the rainwater tank won't spill, um, you know, it won't be like every rainfall you'll get water from the rainwater tank. Um, if obviously it's a downpipe, it would. So that's just something to keep in consideration when you're picking the plants, um, how often are they going to receive water. Um, there's a bit of a material list too if you're looking at doing one. Um, this is downloaded from a Melbourne Water fact sheet. Um, if you, so if you want to know more, um, if you just type in swale fact sheet in Melbourne Water, it will come up. But there's just a little um, shopping list there that you can look at um, afterwards. Um, in terms of maintenance, um, you don't want to fertilise them because then you're just adding um, more nutrients back into the environment which will end up in the local waterways. So to sort of pick something that doesn't need it. Um, you will need to do some weeding of them. Um, but if you want to distribute the flow, so if it's coming out of your downpipe, so it doesn't come down in one big gush, you might want to place some rocks there to break up the force or you can actually get a bit of a flow spreader, which it, it sort of attaches to um, the end of a 90 mil um, sort of stormwater pipe um, and the downpipe, and then it sort of spreads the load so it comes out more of like this sort of slow, even sheet flow rather than um, one big um, uh, sort of point discharge so that it's eroding your um, your garden area. Um, so just having a bit of a look there, see if there's any other questions. Okay, we're all good to go. All right, so just in the last few minutes, um, I'm going to take you through rain gardens. So you might see the rain gardens in um, the streetscape in your local council area. Uh, they are the primary function of rain gardens is to treat stormwater and remove pollutants, um, but you can um, use them in a um, for your own purposes as a way to retain water in the environment and um, you know keep green you know keep green around your garden but I'll show you what the sort of the purest ones look like in the streetscape but for a home garden I wouldn't expect you to go quite as far as as they as council does because you wouldn't necessarily have the same level of pollutants coming off your property um, so again they're normally a pollutant management but they can be an aesthetic um, feature as well and a way to um, keep water in the environment. So in Adelaide, um, we recommend, because of the plant species that are used that remove nutrients, we recommend a lime system. But if you're not using the nitrogen removing species and you're not near any footings, you could have an unlimed system. Um, just be mindful that they, it might need, it will need watering, top up watering like a regular garden if it doesn't, if it isn't lined. And when I say lined, you could line it with a like two mil HDPE liner. Um, and what it, they they have is a is a bottom layer that is is sort of that gravel layer, and it will have an um, an ag pipe in it to take any excess discharge. Then there'll be a layer of sand, and the water will um, be stored in the rain garden up to the height of where your riser out of your um, um, underground. Um, drainage layer, um, the height of that. Um, there's a filter media over the top that would be in a council environment. Um, there's special filter media for rain gardens. And th this special filter media is designed to have not much clay and not much organics so that the water is treated uh, through and moves quickly through the, the water column. Um, so these rain gardens, in a council sense, are used to uh, as an effective way to manage 
and treat stormwater quality and they don't require the size that you would, the treatment size that you would for a wetland. Because you're actually treating vertically um, and the plants and removing as well as treating vertically, you're actually, often they'll be about 10% of the size as if you did an equivalent. You could treat, I suppose, you can, the 10% of the size of a wetland would take up for equivalent treatment of stormwater. Um, and then so often they've got this sort of ponding, this extra ponding area before there's any overflow, and that's really just to have a bit of extra storage. Um, but what they do is, um, yes, yeah, so they're a storage method. We um, built one um, and we've got a, a demonstration video which goes for about eight minutes, so I won't show it for you now. But if you wanted to build one in your backyard, we just picked an old above-ground um, a garden bed basically lined it with the PVC liner that I mentioned and built it from scratch and it took us uh, four hours but um, the guys who were building it with me were going off every half an hour doing lectures with community so if you had two people for like two and a half hours you could whip one up in that time so take a look at the video um, and um, there's some good tips in there on how to do a great above ground rain garden. Um, but the, the one, obviously, most of the ones you see in the council's streetscapes are in the ground. But this gives you de details of how you can make a, a removable or movable above ground one, particularly if you're a renter and you want to build one. No reason why you can't now because um, this is an above ground method. Um, in terms of sizing your rain garden, we've got a bit of a sizing chart. So every 50 square metre of roof, you want to have about one square metre of rain garden, which means in a storm it will overflow a bit. Uh, the main reason for that is um, because of the plants. Um, if you make it too big for the um, amount of catchment air you've got from your roof, the plants will dry out. If you're prepared to do top-up watering, um, you can make them bigger for the same size catchment. So you could make it two metres or three metres for the same roof um, catchment, but just be mindful that you will need to irrigate it. It won't be this sort of garden that you set, set and forget and just hope that the rain off the roof will um, keep the plants alive. Um, you will need to top it up. But that's that's just size for um, Adelaide's environment. So it's approximately what you need to keep it alive. Um, there's a shopping list. Um, so I'll add the shopping list um, to the link to that, to the handouts to Naomi. So if you want to build one, that's everything you need to do to build one. Um, so again, watch the video and then go to the shopping list. Um, this one is actually uh, a wicking bed, but it is connected to a downpipe. So again, if you're an avid gardener, you can um, connect up your downpipe so that it um, discharges into the base of your ga raised garden bed and then it'll act as a wicking bed um, up to um, you know your veggies or your herbs. Um, the, just be careful where you put the height of this overflow. So what will happen is it'll it'll rain, it'll fill, fill, fill to this height and then it will start um, bypassing once it gets to this height it will bypass and then go back out to your council's drainage network. So you just want to make sure that you make this um, offtake from your main downpipe at a suitable height that it's not going to make your um, rain garden's not going to be waterlogged. So you'd still have those sort of subsurface gravel, etc., above your soils. But again, that, the height of that is critical to keep that out of your um, your root, your direct root zone of your plant. Um, just a few other examples of rain gardens. Just keep them away from your house if you've got to have them unlined in your background, back garden. Um, make sure that the, the downpipe slope slopes away. Um, so just take a bit of a look at that um, that image if you're thinking about doing one um, in your backyard and, and you're not going to line it. But again, be careful with your species selection. Um, so yeah, so um, I don't have time. We've run out of time. Uh, we're bang on eight o'clock. So uh, when you get the presentation, have a look. We've got a whole um, a fact sheet on what sort of plants you can plant. Um, just be mindful that if you've got an above ground rain garden, you really only need to look at zone 2A and zone 2B species that are in the species list because that they're just um, that's the treatment zone. You don't have zone 3, which is a batter, or zone 1, which is an inlet. They're more for council um, scale projects. So yeah, stick to zone two, um, and then there's a bit of guide on what sort of species, uh, what sort of uh, plant forms you've got there. So 
I don't have time to go through them, but if you're really keen, have a look at the fact sheet. Um, we've got a couple of fact sheets on rain garden plants um, in, on our website. So just go to community, go to rain gardens, and you can click through and find those. So just before we wrap up, if there's any quest last questions, um, I've got some case studies of some um, projects where people have um, implemented some of these ideas in their own backyard. Um, I haven't had time to get to them today, but I'll make sure they're part of the, um, the presentation that goes down there, and then you can take a bit of a look at them, and I'll make sure that you've got the links through to the case studies on our website, so you can take a bit of a look at them, and there's some um, explanatory text in there. So hopefully, you'll, if you're doing a new build um, or a retrofit in, in your garden, um, you can implement some of those um, projects. So I'm going to skip down to my contact details. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, ideas for your new home on our community page is where you'll find um, a couple of those case studies. Um, so, yeah, oh, I've lost my job title. That disappeared off my. Um... All right, so I'll give you my email address and my phone number, um, and Naomi can share that with you. Um, and then if you want to contact me about any of the material there, um, any advice on trying to put them into your own context at home. Um, by all means, contact me and I'll um, hopefully be able to put you in the right direction. So, um, yeah, thanks for joining us. And, um, yeah, hopefully um, I'll hand over to Naomi and she can let you know um, her plans for making information available. Thanks, Rachel. That was amazing. I learned so much from that. And, and there's lots of useful tools that you have on your website and things to Thanks, guys. Bye. Okay, it's ended. Okay.